476 Anno Domini, the year of the fall of Rome, is one of the most well-known and most discussed dates of European history, and yet probably one of the most overestimated and misunderstood ones for what it has come to represent. Rivers of ink have been devoted to why the Roman Empire fell, and if it actually did. While the historiographical question of if and why it happened continues to be debated to this day, and certainly merits attention, we will not tackle the topic in this video. Instead, we will try to discern how the men and women living in those times saw the changing of their institutions and culture, focusing specifically on the year 476, and we will attempt to ask the question, in the eyes of a Roman citizen, did the Empire of Rome fall in 476? Roman citizens were much less knowledgeable and informed than the people of the modern age currently are, and that's because we have access to platforms like the one provided by the sponsor of this video, Blinkist. Blinkist is all about preserving and sharing knowledge by making it easily digestible even for the busiest among us. It takes the most interesting and relevant non-fictional books and turns them into 15-minute audios, Blinks. More than 3,000 titles are already available, which means that you can learn on the go, learn fast, and always improve your knowledge no matter how time-constrained you are. Blinkist titles range from entrepreneurship to philosophy, from psychology to politics, but most importantly for us, there are hundreds of historical books that you can listen to. Imagine learning the most important facts of four books in just one hour. We recommend Why Don't We Learn From History by Basil Little Hart, so you can learn from history, and The Origins of Political Order by Francis Fukuyama to see how diverse political and social environments allowed Europe to develop many different political systems. New titles are added all the time. Support our channel and your growth. Get yourself premium access to knowledge. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash Kings and Generals are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. To put the year 476 and its events into context, we will first briefly summarize the highs and lows of the empire in its later years. The Imperium began with two prosperous centuries, which saw the Roman state reach its greatest territorial extent and achieve relative internal peace after the civil wars of the first century BC. The first cracks in the system came following the end of the Severian dynasty, which opened the crisis of the third century. It lasted 50 years and saw decimating plagues, a high rate of replacement of emperors, and the fracture of Roman territorial integrity both to the west and to the east. After a resurgence under Diocletian and the Constantine family, the Romans suffered a devastating defeat at Adrianople in 378, and soon after the empire was definitively split in two among the sons of Theodosius from this point, the western half slowly began to fracture, first losing Britannia in 410, and then being reduced piece by piece to just the Italian peninsula and a few neighboring regions, as people from the Barbaricum were pushed over the Limes by the Huns. In the second half of the 5th century, the political structure in Italy was plagued by a number of weak emperors, who were either puppets of Germanic commanders or men sent by the Eastern Roman Empire, who had little sway over the locals. The presence of Germanic nobles and officers so close to the halls of power should not be surprising, as the Roman armies had incorporated more and more of their kin, and the barbarians had become a considerable number of the soldiers, thus being integrated into society, like the generals Stilicho and Aetius. By the year 475, the commander of the troops in Italy, Orestes, deposed the emperor Julius Nepos, who fled to Dalmatia, and elevated to the Ravenese throne his son, Romulus Augustulus. The following year, Orestes was defeated and executed by Odoesa, commander of the Germanic Fuedorati, who had not been paid by the new regime. Odoesa then ended the string of weak emperors by deposing Romulus Augustulus, and possibly having Nepos assassinated in 480. He also sent the imperial regalia to Constantinople, thus proclaiming there was only one emperor. Odoacer would rule Italy as king of the Germans living there and acting as a self-appointed regent for the eastern emperors. His rule ended in 489, when the Gothic prince Theodoric invaded Italy with his people 
and established control after four years of war, founding the Kingdom of the Ostrogoths. So how was the dissolution of the empire felt by the citizens of the Roman Empire? That's a hard question to answer, and a few factors have to be taken into consideration. The geographic location was certainly important, as certain parts of the state were lost at different times and under different conditions, such as Brittany, which was abandoned in 410 during a succession crisis and was never reabsorbed into the empire, while the whole of Gaul was occupied by Germanic people in less than 10 years, different events would be catastrophic in one area while being barely noticeable in others. Social position also made a difference. It's hard to know if the average peasant noticed any change in the state, because we do not have any testimonies from them, but we could assume that the daily life of a farmer did not change much unless they were victims of attack. On the other hand, the Roman landowners and aristocracy that survived the invasions felt a change, as now they had to come to terms with the new Germanic kings, while the central Roman state disappeared in the periphery. Lastly, the settlement of some Germanic people was a slow integration in some parts of the empire, and this could happen over generations, so even if some change did happen, it was possibly hardly felt, while in other regions it was much more traumatic. We can discern the mood of some inhabitants of the empire if we look at some ecclesiastical writers who were less interested in the political situation and instead narrate the lives and miracles of the saints of the time. From them, we get different points of view on the social situation, and it's interesting to see how some authors underline the transformation which occurred with the arrival of the barbarians, affirming a point of rupture, while others minimize their presence, speaking about a continuation of life and norms. Of the latter, we have as an example the life of Saint Germanus of Auxerre, described by Constantius of Lyon. While narrating the good deeds completed by the bishop in an invaded Gaul, we can read a society where the Germanic and Alanic peoples are participating in daily life and are not the cause of all evils. On the other side of the coin, we have Sidonius Apollinaris, Roman aristocrat and Bishop of Auvergne, where he led the Roman resistance against the Visigoths. He thought that the situation in Gaul was polarized between a barbaric invader and a dying Roman culture. A strong supporter of the old Roman norms that he had been educated in, he felt that they were constantly in danger from the Germanic people. In his mind, the only remedy to this decadence was to escape to the monasteries where the Romans could conserve their culture. Having now painted a general picture of those years, let us look now at what the contemporaries thought about the deposition of the last Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus. One of our most important sources of those years is the anonymous Valesianus, an author of whom we have two texts which describe the events from the age of Constantine to the end of the reign of Theodoric, mentions the deposition of 476, commenting that the young emperor was allowed to live in exile in Naples with a pension. The event is not described with any hint of importance, as he certainly does not talk about the end of an empire or of the Roman world. As far as the Italian Romans were concerned, the empire as a political institution continues to exist. In fact, the sack of Rome, perpetrated by Alaric's Visigoths in 410, had a much greater effect on the writers of the time, prompting the Christian philosopher and bishop, Saint Augustinus, to write his most important work, The City of God, to defend the Christian faith from attacks coming from pagans who saw Christianity as the cause of the weakness of Rome. The Bishop of Milan, St. Ambrose, contemporary of Augustinus, underlines the dark times they were living in and the decline of the empire, not of the church, something that the historian Ammianus Marcellinus rebuked, writing that the empire had always bumped back. Two interesting figures who wrote a few years later about the events were Anodius and Cassiodorus. Both of them lived under the reign of the first Ostrogothic king of Italy, and both of them were supporters of Theodoric, so it's important to underline that they had an interest in depicting the king in a favourable light, attempting to consolidate his legitimacy in the eyes of Roman Italians and the Eastern Empire. Enodius was a clergyman from Gaul 
who moved to northern Italy very young, where he would become Bishop of Pavia and Papal Envoy. He gives us an interesting insight into the mind of an aristocratic Gallo-Roman, with connections both in Italy and in Gaul. Receiving the education of a Roman aristocrat, based on memories of past splendours, Anodius was disenchanted with the situation of the Empire of Italy. The deposition of Romulus was just a substitution of one weak ruler for another, in a state that had been long declining, but it was not the culmination of this decline. His views on the Germanic people are mixed, as we can see in his biography of his predecessor Epiphanius, Bishop of Pavia. Here he depicts in much better light the barbarian Ricimer, a Gothic commander in Italy, than his counterpart, Emperor Anthemius, who had been sent by the Eastern Empire. Later the opposite happens, when the rivals are Emperor Nepos and the Visigothic king Euric. So although he viewed the Romans and the barbarians differently, he didn't have a strong bias in favour of one or the other. When Odoacer takes control of Italy, Enodius makes no mention of Romulus or Gustulus, describing Orestes as a Roman patrician defeated by the Fuederati. Odoacer is shown as just another ruler of a declining state, like his imperial predecessor, and only when Theodoric becomes king does the situation improve again. Cassiodorus was an Italian statesman and historian who worked for Theodoric and reached high political positions under the Ostrogoths' reign from around 505 to 535. He was born around 485, so a decade after the deposition of the last Western Emperor, and he wrote a history of the Goths, now lost to us, with the intent of integrating the Gothic world into the Roman. What remains from him is a watered-down chronicle of events and other fragments, but once again Romulus Augustulus's deposition is not mentioned. We can also still discern his opinions on Odoacer and his arrival to power, which are similar to Enodius's. He is presented as a usurper of the Western Empire, ineffective and corrupt, not unlike many others before him. His act of sending the imperial insignia to Constantinople is strange for Cassiodorus, but he does not interpret them as the end of institutions, nor that the Eastern Roman Empire now rules the West. When the Ostrogoths entered Italy and established themselves at Ravenna, the Western Roman Empire returned partially to its splendour after a century of decline, although greatly resized. So while it is important to remember that the authors mentioned up until now certainly had the interests to portray Theodoric as the legitimate ruler of Italy, we cannot ignore how little emphasis is put on the year 476. Certainly the Empire and the Roman world were in decline in the West, but it had been so for nearly a century, and the arrival of a barbarian governor like Odoacer made little difference in the minds of Romans. While a usurper in the eyes of many, he was still the head of what remained of the Empire of Italy, and that idea had not died. But what did the Eastern writers think about the topic? Some authors, like their Western counterparts, barely mention it. The historian Zosimus wrote around the year 510 about the decadence of Rome and the role of the Christian faith in its decline. While his work is incomplete, it was probably meant to end at the sack of Rome, and he never alludes to the year 476. However, it did not take long for the writers of the time to mention the horror that the deposition of Romulus symbolised, or rather the disappearance of the emperors in the western half of the Roman Empire. The historian Marcellinus Comes of Dalmatia, who wrote his chronicle around the year 519, puts emphasis on the victory of Odoacer, as does the historian of Gothic origins but of Byzantine sympathies, Jordanes, who wrote around 551 the Getica, a history of the Goths, possibly inspired by Cassiodorus's lost work. When talking about the events of 476, both of them have the exact same comment. The Western Roman Empire, of which title was first taken by August Octavian in the year 709 from the founding of Rome, died with this Augustulus. The historian Martin Wares has put forward the conjecture that both of them quoted the Roman aristocrat Memmius Symmachus, consul under Odoacer, and an important figure in Rome until he and his son-in-law and philosopher Boatius 
were executed at the order of Theodoric in the latter part of his reign. Should this hypothesis be correct, it would indicate that some parts of the Roman aristocracy opposed the new royal power in Italy, and did not look with a good eye to the transition from Roman emperors to Germanic kings, such as Odoacer or the Amalians, the family of Theodoric. However, just like the previous authors, we have to remember that Marcellinus and Jordanes possibly had an agenda when writing about these events. The Eastern Empire barely tolerated the reigns of Germanic people in the West, and once they had the stability and the resources, Emperor Justinian began the reconquest of those regions, first attacking the Vandals in 533, and two years later beginning the Gothic War for the reconquest of Italy, which lasted nearly 20 years. Because of this, it was important for the Emperor to paint the occupation of Italy by the Goths as illegitimate both to justify the heavy costs of the war and to bring onto his side the local Italian population. The historian Procopius does not note it either, but he was hostile to the Justinian regime and was sometimes sympathetic with the Goths, so he might also have had a reason not to mention it. Later, lesser-known Greek authors like Evagrius would continue to acknowledge the year 476 as the end of the Western Roman Empire. So in the end, did the Western Roman Empire fall in 476 in the eyes of its citizens? We would argue that no, it did not. The situation of the Roman government had been in a constant state of flux for decades, and the arrival of a barbarian king who nominally reigned under the name of the empire was not a reason to believe that the Roman institutions had disappeared. It is only later, when Justinian began his conquest of Italy, when our historical sources begin to underline the importance of the year 476. We're planning to talk about Justinian in our future videos, so make sure you're subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.